Unstoppable Real Estate Investors. I'm Rayana Starr coming to you live in my Unstoppable Real Estate Investor Facebook group. And you are welcome to jump on the Zoom. Uh, Rose will provide the link to join Tim and I in Zoom. We will not be answering questions while I'm talking to Tim, but if you have questions at the end um, or during, please feel free to pop them in the, the chat live on Facebook in the group. If you're seeing this recording in another group, then just know that you're welcome to join our community. It's a small but mighty group and we're growing um, called the Unstoppable Real Estate Investor. I also go live on Mondays. I will not be going live in the Unstoppable Real Estate Investor group on Mondays anymore. I will be shifting the focus of Mondays to Mindset Mondays. So it will focus on human design and neuro-linguistic programming. And I will be doing those, those Mindset Monday lives from my Permission to Be Human Design group. And then on Fridays, because I had such an outpouring of comments and support, we are going to keep the Fun Friday Campfire discussions for now on Fridays at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. on Mondays as well, and then noon on Wednesdays is the podcast. So those are the three lives I do every week. And I have with me Tim Winfrey, who has a unique approach to wholesaling that he'll be sharing and right now he's just in a couple of markets, but would like to syndicate and take his unique approach to wholesaling um, across the states. He works with agents as well as investors. So Tim, welcome to my podcast, the Unstoppable Real Estate Investor Podcast. And let me get my little background. So I'm all professional and branded here. Hold on. There we go. All Beautiful. right. So Tim, tell me a little bit about what what you what who was Tim before real estate investing? Give us a little background on yourself. It's an interesting question, right? Cuz I'm second generation. Um unfortunately or pr probably fortunately for me actually, um I don't really remember life without real estate. Um so I was raised by a single father and ever since I was three to five years old, I've been looking at houses with them. If you didn't have a babysitter, guess what? I got to come with. Um, so second generation, my dad has been flipping houses for quite some time as well. And ever since I was in like sixth grade, I've been doing a lot of blue collar work for him. Um, so difficult question to answer because essentially investing has been a part of my life from the very beginning in some capacity or at least retail agency. Oh, cool. Yes. Yeah, so, but on the retail side, you and I have that in common because I grew up with my mom, who was a real estate broker. She mm -hmm. was Century 21. It was in Poway in San Diego County. And then we went off on our own and had our own brokerage by her name, Fancy Boyden Associates. And that was decades ago. Um, but I grew up with her, you know, being a very successful broker, but also buying rentals, doing a little bit of rehabbing, but mostly buying rentals. And so same thing, similar backgrounds. So, but that was really more on the retail side. Mm -hmm. Did you ever do anything else professionally or was it all working in the real estate brokerage ever since you were young and you haven't really done any other types of jobs? I've done a couple other jobs. Um, so I've been in some capacity working with my dad essentially since um, I was a working age. Um, but I've done some other things. When I was 16 to about 22 or so, uh, I worked at a McDonald's. And <laughs> a lot of people um, <laughs> don't realize how systematized and, and a lot, they're really dialed in in a lot of ways. Um, so I worked up to assistant GM. I think I was making like 30 grand a year at uh, 20 years old with six weeks of vacation and amazing benefits. Um, but most importantly, like they're really dialed in on their standard operating procedures and stuff like that. So I've actually carried a lot from that um, to my career currently. I've also 
worked at a startup e-cigarette company <laughs> that was oh um, wow that was around 2011 or so um <coughs> and that was interesting it was a very different world um we were doing customer service there um and then from there i transitioned pretty much full time into real estate my dad was flipping probably about seven or eight houses at that time and i've learned most of the trades um I've chosen not to learn plumbing because that one is a nasty job and I don't enjoy it. it. Is. Um, <laughs> but I have pretty basic knowledge of everything else. Um, and then from there, I started doing a lot of REOs. And then I managed a lot of fix and flips for another mentor of mine, Saul Sanka Vicious. Um, so I did have a couple jobs, um, but, but pretty much from about 24 onward, I've been full-time real estate. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a little chest things. So I cough a little bit here and there, but mostly real estate. So when did you start to shift into like getting serious about being a full-time real estate investor as a profession? Yeah, great question. Um, so what was it? I think in 2015, I was managing the front end of REOs for my mentor, Saul. Um, so we did a couple hundred transactions, but what ended up happening around 2016, <laughs> 2017, I don't remember the exact dates, is the REO market essentially completely dried up, right? Like there was a huge boom of REO foreclosure activity and eventually, you know, the market stabilized and that, that income opportunity was no longer there, or at least not at the volume that made sense for us. Um, so naturally, all the skill sets required of an REO agent are natural transition over to investing. Um, so we were looking what to do at the time. You know, REO agents have to figure out before prices, after prices, project repairs, manage contractors. I mean, essentially, it's the same thing. You just don't get paid as well. Um, so <laughs> what Saul did is he found um, somebody with really, really big pockets, and we transitioned right into fix and flipping. Um and I think that was 2017. We did like 30 deals that first year. Um, wow, you didn't mess around. You just dove in feet first and hit the ground running, huh? Yeah, well, luckily the REO business was a great foundation. You know, I mean, essentially we were doing the same activities, but we were getting paid a whole lot better for them. Awesome. Good for you. And so then what? Great question. Um, well... Naturally, as as a young person doing a lot of that stuff, I believe um, my split with Saul was like 10%. And, you know, I look at that and I'm just like, well, I'm finding the deals. I'm managing the contractors. I should get paid better. So I kind of went off on my own from there. And it was interesting because you don't realize how much overhead somebody has and still you create it on your own or, or really – all the moving parts, like you feel like you have the full picture, but you really don't. Um, so I went off on my own, I believe that was in 2017. Um, and ultimately I ended up having to go to retail to pay the bills um, because I was well-versed there. Um, but through all the retail- So as an agent, you were get, making yes. more of your paychecks as an agent. Now, were you building your rental portfolio at this point? Or were you just doing fix and flips and wholesaling? Actually, at that point, after Saul, I was mostly just residential um, real estate. Okay. Um, but, but what I found is with my experience in the REO world and the fix and flipping world that, you know, I didn't really enjoy working with buyers at all. <laughs> like getting the leads was fine, but it was a yeah. They run you ragged, and then yeah. they <laughs> buy a house without you. Yeah. Um. So I was constantly looking for ways um to to get in touch with more sellers, and that actually what is what brought me back into like the wholesale world. Because with Saul, we were using strategies like Auction dot com and things like that to find our leads. Um. I found the wholesale, just the lead generation, the marketing strategies. I'm always blown away that more agents aren't doing this because there's just there's four listing leads for every off-market lead, right? <laughs> so, um, Yeah, it, it's it's amazing to me as well. People talk and they still, it shows you people that are stuck in an old paradigm and not, sh not pivoting that yeah. think, oh, off-market. I can only do off-market. And they mm -hmm. don't realize how much is on market. I mean, you get a privy account and you have access and you look on there and a lot of stuff that's on market is priced well. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you still got to do your numbers and do your analyzer and all that and come in and you're still making low ball offers, but there's a lot on market and it's more cost effective. It, it's, it's not as much of a grind. You're not having to buy lists and skip trace them and then cold call through that list. You can find more properties more easily on market. And then there are people that are building relationships with agents. I know a couple of guys I was coaching that did a million last year and are, are wanting to do 2 million this year completely on agent outreach campaign. They do no searching for properties. All their properties come through agents, pocket listings, all of them. And they do a million a year doing that, not looking for any properties, not buying any lists. Now you do something similar. Talk about how you approach wholesaling because it's unique how you do it with agents. Mm -hmm. Talk about specifically your model and how you developed it. I love that question. Um, so first off, comment about those agents. Like they say there's the riches are in the niches for a reason, right? When you're focused on one activity, one lead generation source, what it forces you to do is become the very best at it. Um, <laughs> so um, that's why it works. And also you have a very clear message. Um, so the model that we're we're building out right now is fairly new. We're, we have it launched in Orlando right now. We have some other markets that will be coming up soon. Um, San Diego and Milwaukee. Um, we have our eyes on Louisville. We don't have a partner yet. But basically the way that we do it um, is we're looking for agents in those markets to essentially partner up with um, because agents already have a lot of resources. They know the market, which is extremely important because um, – Coming from Chicago, I just know anybody trying to come from another market, trying to just drop into Chicago, it's very difficult to comp homes if you don't know the area, if you don't know how to bracket homes properly and things like that. So we're looking for somebody with some local market knowledge. In particular, we're looking for a real estate agent that is already fixed and flipping, and they're looking to flip like 10 deals or more. And they're also looking for more listings. Um, so essentially, the way the partnership works is um, we do all the marketing. It's done for you. We give you all the listing leads that we get. There's no fees or anything for that. They're yours. Um, and you also get first crack at all the wholesale deals that we find um, so that we could get your fix and flip business rolling and hitting your goals that you want. We could cover all the marketing costs with the listings that come but in. But your target is agents. Yes. And the reason the target is agents is because I could speak their language really well. And I have an audience on Facebook of like 5,000 people that are all agents. So it's like, how can I find these how can I help right. these people? Um, how can we find win-win scenarios, essentially? So that's the, the brass bones, um, brass tacks of it. Yes. So how long have you been doing that? And how many wholesales are you closing every month with agents? Great question. Um, so this is actually almost brand new. I think we've been doing it for about 90 days. So we're live in Orlando. Obviously, I'm in Chicago. And... Um, that's not an Asian partnership, right? But um, Orlando, we're about five weeks in. I think we have, what is it? Um, so, so far, we've already put 55 long-term follow-up listing leads in there. Um, we're actively working on three wholesale deals right now. And I believe we have three listing contracts already out in six weeks. And do you get paid a referral fee for the listing contracts? Um, in that market, yes. Um, in future markets, probably not. Our goal is to get the agent their marketing fees back, and we, we want to do that by giving them the listing leads that we get. Yes, so what's in it for you then? How are you getting paid? The wholesale deals that the agents don't want, um, basically. Um, we're going to be working okay, on Okay, so the agents are paying for all your marketing, and mm -hmm. so you're generating leads for listings or the agents that want to do fix and flips. And then you get all the distressed property wholesale leads that they don't want to list. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then it dip, and then the, um, like the terms on that are, are a little bit variable by market because if they want to help us with the wholesale deals, we, we have more reasonable commissions, but if they don't want to do anything at all, we could do that too. Um, so that part varies. It depends on how active of a role they want to have on the wholesale model. Um, but essentially 
easily like they should be able to get easily two to four listings a month. And if they want to flip 10 to 12 houses a year, we could find those deals for them and we'll find much better deals from them than they would find on their house on their own 99% of the time. And then they could also get some income cuts on the wholesale deals, depending on how much of a role they want to play. So how are you finding all those leads for them? Are you guys buying lists and skip tracing them and targeting certain niches? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways that we do it. Um, one niche in particular that I'm a big fan of is is fire damage, um, because most people don't ah. know what to do with them. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's just good. And they have a real pain point, right? Something that they can't solve. Yeah, so, those <laughs> are often properties that just get abandoned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So fire damage is one niche. Another one that that is new that we're launching out, but we're already having pretty decent success with it, is um, cold outreach in volume, talking 1,000, 3,000 a day to attorneys, um, state attorneys and probate attorneys, anybody that we could build a referral partnership with. And we make that a real win-win too, so that they get paid on every transaction that we do. Um, so that's another one. And then all the standard stuff every wholesaler is doing. You know, we buy lists, we use 80-20 for data. Um, we do text messages, we do voicemails. Uh, we don't do a ton of postcards currently, but we have in the past. Um, what I've found speaking to a lot of wholesalers, there's not a ton of new strategies, but what works, works. Essentially, you scale up volume and you get more leads. Nice. And how big a team do you have? We like to keep things fairly lean. Um, and when I say that is, I believe there's only about seven of us currently. Um, we're not looking to grow a big team. We're not looking to build a massive volume of units sold. We we are far more focused on profit per deal than the amount of volume that we do. I would much rather do four thirty thousand dollar deals than twenty ten thousand deals. Right? It's just easier. Yeah, yeah. Nice, love it. And what about is this? the main gig for you um what about building up a passive income stream for yourself where are you what are you doing there great question um i'm actually not really a passive investor yet um when i do do that i'm probably going to be looking at the commercial space my partner of mine is buying shopping malls across the country although largely in ohio that are about 40% occupied. And as long as the city's okay with it, he will convert roughly 50% of that into storage and flex space, um, which is a great way to buy undervalued properties and then add a ton of value to it once you get some long-term tenants in there. Um, and just, because I've interviewed a lot of people too, what I've found is that people in the triple net game, uh, it appears that they have much longer leases and much less stress <laughs> compared to the residential model. Um, so in terms of passive income, like my goal is to create a business that creates a lot of passive income where I'm just managing leaders um, and sales there people. Yeah. Um, and um, then the next step is going to be more commercial real estate investing because we could do value add there. And then the triple net leasing game is just, in my opinion, superior to residential based on what I've seen. So that's so the plan. explain to people who are newer what you mean by triple net game? That's a fantastic question. So for context first, I'm still learning commercial real estate. I, I will not pretend I'm an expert there yet, um, but essentially a triple net lease um, is the lease terms. It's a business to business transaction, um, which is why I prefer that over residential. Um, and also those leases tend to be longer term. Um, you could get somebody to commit to a 15 year lease and not only does that add equity essentially in instantly to the property that you acquire, um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the triple net lease essentially is, is just the lease terms. Um, like the tenant actually covers quite a bit of the, the things in the triple net lease. Um, does that make sense? Sounded like you... We're about to say more and then yeah. stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I was about to say, I, I don't feel like diving deep into the granular details of the triple net lease yet, just yeah, because uh, I don't want to misinform people. Like I have sure. other people that will support me in that game um, because right. I would be asking questions. I don't want to just throw information out there that might not be true. Yeah. Or at least not 100% correct. So you're, it's building the wholesale business, getting it to a point where you're just leading your leaders. That's a passive stream of income. And now you're currently studying to prepare to be more in the commercial space and specifically 
underutilized commercial spaces like malls that have a lot, lot of vacancy and repurposing how the space is used. And um, that's where you'll really build up your, your passive portfolio. Mm -hmm. No interest in single family or anything. You feel like the commercial spaces just makes more sense. In my opinion, um, and that's also because when I was doing, you know, residential real estate, I've managed quite a decent amount of properties and I did not enjoy that process. I did not enjoy evicting people. I had to do it. I found somebody deceased once. There's a hundred reasons um, why I don't really want to get into the right. residential game um, because logistics are not really my strong suit and, and it's a logistically heavy weight. Obviously, I could hire somebody else for property management, but most people are you know, cash flowing like $200 a month or something like that. And I just feel like, at least based on my network and my experience, I have better avenues to take. Yeah, that are going to cash flow more, right? Mm -hmm. What else do you want people to, like, wh what would you say has been your biggest challenge or struggle in the real estate investment game? It's a great question um, because business is challenges, and, you know, like your ability to plow through challenges and, and get from, through one challenge, solve it, and then you'll find a new challenge. There's always a problem after every solution that you find, right? Like everybody's always looking to arrive one day when really you're just going to find new, better problems. Um, <laughs> so I would say the biggest challenge for, for me and for anybody really is getting your mindset right, honestly, and, and just knowing yeah. how to talk to yourself in your mind and how to take the right activities daily. I know that's a very simple answer, um, but it's the right answer in my opinion. Well, that's my my... <laughs> domain is yeah. I say that a lot to people that mindset impacts and influences everything literally because it all starts there a thought generates a feeling generates a reaction or an action that generates you know you creating some kind of result in the physical reality and if you know you believe you're a loser, you're going to just look for evidence that makes you right about being a loser, and you're not going to give it everything you've got. Mindset fuels motivation. And so I absolutely agree with that, that mindset is your thoughts, your feelings, your perceptions, your attitude. It It affects so much in how you approach life and if you feel like you have a can-do attitude and you feel like hey i'm an eternal learner and i'm i'm excited about the challenges of learning something new and i'm going to give it everything i you've got versus a mindset or attitude of oh you know nothing ever works out for me i can't do it and you know i mean you could just see you can just see how my energy shifts, you know, mm -hmm. you're not going to give it what it needs to get the results you want. And yeah, you get to be right. You get to mm -hmm. be right about how you perceive things. So anything else you want us to know about you, you know, a pitch, a plug, um, a, a helpful hint that you would like to offer to people. Yeah, absolutely. I think on top of mindset, um, the next thing that's the most important is not being afraid of failure. Um, I'm not going to be the first person to say it, but failure is the way. The more often you fail, the more of a realistic view you have of the world, of what actually works. Um, a lot of people could have theoretical knowledge. You could gain that in an afternoon, right? Most people actually know how to wholesale. If they've watched a YouTube video that details the strategy, you already know how to do it. Most people just don't do it. Um, like, yeah. you just need to take action. You can't right. learn from your actions if you're and they give up too mind. soon because mm -hmm. wholesaling is a grind. You really mm -hmm. have to, and you have to adjust and refine, and you've got to do the numbers. And if you're not making multiple offers a day and lots and lots of offers every week, you, it's volume, and in the volume you learn 
your craft. You master your craft. Practice it to master it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if you were to jump up on a rooftop and you had words of wisdom and you had a captive audience and they were hanging on your every word and like we're going to follow through and take action based on your advice, what would your advice be to new investors? Um, basically, simple again, because simple is what scales. Track everything you do, um, every single thing you do, in particular, your very important lead indicators like your dials, your offers, your contracts, so on and so forth. Your you track APIs. everything. Your yes. APIs. Um, have very, very detailed tracking, and you scale out your lead indicators until your lag indicators hit your goals. So if you're not getting your goals, you you call more people, or you get other people to call more people. And then once you have that bottleneck solved and you have too many appointments, you figure out how to get more qualified appointments. Like it becomes a very systematic way to do it. You, you just talk to more people until you have too many appointments. Then you get more qualified people <laughs> um, and you just continue to do that. It is just volume of activity. Keep doing it. Keep doing more. Keep getting better. Train every day. Record your calls. Go over those calls with your team. Go over ways to get better on every single call, and eventually it becomes a very, very simple process. It doesn't take a lot of thought. It's a lot easier than most people think it is, but it is hard to get off the ground. Yeah, it's simple, but not easy because you've got to put in the reps. And that's mm -hmm. where people who aren't getting results live, is they're not putting in the time. They're not mm -hmm. putting in the reps to master the skill and they're not doing the numbers. They've got to do the numbers, do the numbers and be willing to hang in there long enough and pay attention. Like you said, tracking so important. I remember um, working with a client I have, and this was like middle of last year sometime. And he had, he has a team lean too. You don't have to have a big team in this business to do well but he had some VAs and they were cranking out 150 offers a week and they weren't getting anything under contract. And after months of this, I said, you know, I would keep challenging him on it. I'd say, something's up. You're, you're putting out the offers and that ratio of for every 50 sellers you talk to, you're gonna write half of them in offers to get one deal which is an industry average was blown out of the water. They weren't that, that, that ratio there, there wasn't a ratio. They were just making a lot of offers, but they weren't getting accepted. I said, Hey, look, this has gone on long enough. It's time to evaluate. Let's go back the last three months and evaluate every offer you made. Look at what it, did sell for what your offer was and see what you notice in that data. And he is a visionary and has an integrator partner and they both did that. She noticed one thing, he noticed another. I don't even remember what it was, but it was like mind blowing for both of them and exciting because they could see a pattern and it adjusted their, how they did their deal analysis, that's where it impacted is like, and some of the formula formulas in the deal analyzer were altered because they realized, oh, we've got to get closer in our parameters of the offers we're making that are going to be more likely to be accepted. And so analyzing that data, like you said, really tracking really helped them and it shifted the way they did things. And and they were more successful in the offers they were making. They still do volume, but it is, it's a volume game, which has you master your skills and then it's refining and getting it to really an art as much as a science. And then you find your sweet spot and you can rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Would you agree with that? 100%. And I really love the emphasis on skills. Um, I feel like 
Um, everybody's looking for an easy button, right? And I could promise yeah. you I've looked long and hard. I've interviewed 450 real estate experts as well. That It does not exist. Um, so if you're looking for an easy button, if you're looking for free money, you're never going to find it and you're going to be looking forever. Um, but if you focus on growing up your focus, if you're new, there's two skills that matter, being able to generate leads and how to convert leads. Like just focus on marketing and sales, get really good at those two things. And you yeah. will be amazed because those skills transfer over to any industry. Honestly, what they I love do. about um, real estate marketing or at least wholesale marketing, I mean, it's just direct response marketing. Um, <laughs> like That's what it is. Um, you do it at very high volume. Direct response marketing is a tremendous way to make money. Um, so get good at marketing, get good at sales. Everything else will take care of itself. There's and be skills. willing to put in the time, put in the reps, yeah. put in the, the hours. I mean, because that's how you get good at the skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it feels awkward and uncomfortable at first. And that's where you really need support of a coach. You need accountability. You need someone. Like I have a guy... He's probably watching. Um, let's see. Yep, he's here. That um, just was having a hard time making the time. He's starting a wholesaling business. And I said, well, why don't you just check in with me every day and text me that you put in one hour. Just put in one hour a day. Let's start there. That you went into your pipeline and you worked with your leads. And that one simple piece of accountability turned things around for him. And we had a coaching call earlier this morning and he's rocking and rolling. Like he hasn't gotten any deals yet, but, and he's working with a VA, but he's gotten like, he used to be overwhelmed mm -hmm. and would be kind of lost in the process. And now he's like, okay, I get the, pro oh, I love this. I love it. I I'm getting it now. He was willing to put in the time and the effort to learn this skill. And now he'll just hang in there until he gets his first deal. So, you know, I, I'm i agreeing with a lot of what you're saying. Now, you have a podcast also. Tell us a little bit about your podcast. Absolutely. Before I jump into that, I want to kind of reiterate your accountability point. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan. Of, of end of day reports it's yes and end of week reports <laughs> yes. yeah so so you should have a process where at the end of the day you reflect upon it and you kind of grade your day did i keep my promises to myself did i do what i said i was going to do did i meet my minimum goal it's like my goal is to have at least 10 what i call a triage call i call that anything over five minutes right <laughs> if i have 10 of those calls a day and i set two or three appointments a day we're going to make a lot of money um and that will like anybody you do that, but you have to daily reflect upon it. Like, how can I be better tomorrow? What did I do wrong today? And things like that. And if you have a group of people, you're all sharing these reports with each other. First off, as a leader, it makes it very easy to identify what people need. Um, because it's like, oh, I don't have clarity on this. And it's like, okay, right. well, I could give you clarity. Um, so end of day reports are great. I don't do end of week report yet, but maybe I should start. Um, the podcast That helps <laughs> when you're running a team of virtual assistants or- yeah a team of people that are doing the grunt work because mm -hmm. that gets monotonous and people burn out of those types of jobs pretty quickly. So that can be a good thing for like a VA team at the end of the week kind of thing. Yeah. And it also makes tracking a lot easier. Like if we're tracking every step of the sales process, like reschedules and shows for the appointments, no shows, everything like that becomes very difficult to do that at volume if you don't have like a, a, a one source of information, right? Like, boom, this is what happened today. This person no showed, this person showed up, blah, blah, blah. Then a VA could do all your tracking for you. But if you don't have a system like that, you have to seek out the information. You need to talk to your acquisitions every day to find out what happened at these appointments. That's not very efficient. Um, so it's about efficiency, yeah. basically. <laughs> it's, it's how do you get all the information you need in an easy process that is a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Accountability is important and it doesn't have to be this crack the whip. Like there are certain words that can trigger people. Accountability is one of them where people feel it's restricting their freedom. And I, I feel completely the, the opposite. It, it actually gives you freedom, having accountability, knowing that there's someone else watching someone else 
that cares, that you're checking in with, motivates you. Accountability motivates you. It keeps you going. And then, um, you know, this idea of failure. Um, I have this, the four, the three Fs, fear, frustration, and failure are part of the process. Facing mm -hmm. fear of the unknown. People don't put in the time, put in the reps because they're afraid that they're going to fail. And they're afraid because they don't know what to expect yet. They're afraid because they don't have the skills of talking to sellers. They don't have those negotiation skills yet. So they're fearful of the unknown. And then frustration, when you're learning something new and you know where you want to get to, there's, there's those levels of competency. Ignorance is bliss, unconscious incompetence, happiest place to be. But when you move into conscious incompetence, that's the most uncomfortable stage that most people aren't willing to do the work in. And that is the working stage of, wow, I'm really aware of what how I'm not skilled. I have to hang in there and put in my time and my reps to then progress to the third stage of competence, which is conscious competence. Like, oh, I'm starting to get it. I'm, I'm starting to convert leads. Oh, this is great. And a lot of people stop there because they have a, they're uncomfortable with success. They don't, they don't see themselves as that person who can do that. And you got to hang in there with that. <clears throat> Eventually mastery is unconscious competence. You could do it in your sleep. You've done so many reps, that idea of 10,000 hours at something is mastery. And so I love what you're saying. <clears throat> so talk a little bit about your podcast. <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, I do have some thoughts there too. Um, it's funny. It's the, like the Dunning-Kruger effect. Like I've done a lot of things in my life and, and that is always the case. The, the consciously or unconsciously incompetent phase. You, the beginner's luck. Ignorance part. is it's a, <laughs> It is always there. Um, no matter how good you are in similar, and then fields. the next stage, awareness <laughs> is curative, but it sure is uncomfortable. And then there's, oh, I'm starting to get it, yay! And then there's, oh, I don't even have to think about it anymore. And then there's, back to the fear, frustration, and failure. We fear the unknown, what we're not sure of, what we lack confidence in. We're frustrated because we have unrealistic expectations that I, I should know how to do this. I, it should be easy this unrealistic expectation that, oh, I read it in a book or I saw it on a training. Okay, I know how to do it now. No, no, you don't. Wholesaling no. <laughs> sounds quite simple, but it's actually pretty complicated and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of effort and skill. There's a lot of refining at different stages in that process. And then there's failure. Having the humility and the patience to pay your dues. And like you said, I love what you said earlier, Tim. Failure is wonderful because failure is getting you in touch with reality and showing you what's so and you learn from it. And by learning, failure gives a lot of value because you know from your own experience what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it's clear you have certainty from that. So I love that. Absolutely. And and I love talking about fear too, um, because you can't do really much of anything in life if you don't ever try to accomplish or, or overcome your fears is a better word. And I, I like this quote. I don't remember where it came from, but you're going to have fear in business. Um, courage is not the absence of fear. It is being able to feel the fear and do it anyways. Yeah. The, and there is a difference between... Fear, I mean, between courage and fearlessness. Um, mm -hmm. Courage is taking action in spite of fear. You're facing fear and not letting it stop you. Fearless is you just don't, you have a high <laughs> threshold for fear like I yeah. do. I there, there are certain areas in my life where a health or a financial thing can spark a little fear in me but then i just get right into practical how am i going to solve that so fear motivates me 
sometimes mm -hmm. it freezes people they're oh my god um but i i just lost my train of thought what was i just saying you you said fear motivates people yeah you can use fear to motivate you and mm -hmm. you know there's fight flight or freeze you know and mm -hmm. then what I also find when I'm coaching people is breaking things down, nibbling away at the elephant one bite at a time, that oftentimes where there's fear or something you're frustrated at or something you're failing at, there's a linchpin. There's mm -hmm. one little aspect of that that needs to be addressed. And once you figure out what that is, oftentimes it's a limiting belief or a fear that just needs to be addressed and recontextualized. That's why I like neuro-linguistic programming, because mm -hmm. you're recontextualizing the way your mind holds something, and it can make a huge difference. And so um, we keep, I keep trying to get to your podcast, but we keep talking philosophically <laughs> because yeah, sorry. <laughs> we like the fear and the frustration and the failure and the overwhelm and the this and the that. So talk about your podcast. Yeah, sorry, I keep deferring that question. <laughs> it's like, I like where you're going. Um, so yeah, the podcast is called the Freedom Chasers Podcast. I have a partner with that, Matt Cavanaugh. Um, we both host the shows and, and we post it um, separately. Um, we used to do it together, but we've just found we could do more volume and volume is everything, right? Um, so it's a Freedom Chasers Podcast. It is real estate centric, but it's not 100% real estate, um, right? Like our goal is to find and, and network with anybody in the business space, really, um, and, and bring insights that can be applied across business industries. Because if you're a real estate investor, you're a business owner. Um, so we've spoken to a lot of online marketers and coaches and things like that, as well as real estate. I would say 80% of the show is real estate centric, though. Yeah, love that. And where can people find that podcast? Um, anywhere podcasts can be, um, so it'll be on Spotify, iTunes, all that fun stuff. It's on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, anywhere you could find a podcast. Freedom Chasers. Yeah, the Freedom Chasers podcast. Okay, I'm going to go on to YouTube and look it up and put a link in. Freedom Chasers podcast. Clarify your vision, John Shuett. Was he one yeah. of yours? That was the last one we did. We're not as active as we were before. Um, okay. I'll I'll put all that right. copy. Back, I'll put that copy into the the comments so people could at least get to that one episode and because I think a lot of my audience would probably enjoy your podcast as well. Mm -hmm. So let me put that, um, check out Tim's Freedom Chasers podcast on you, YouTube, Spotify, or iTunes. Here's um, of his last episode. How often do you guys do pod your podcast? Um, for now, I'm not super active with it. We used to do it three days a week. Um, but right now, essentially, if I meet somebody interesting or if somebody reaches out to me and they want to come on the show, usually, if it makes sense, I'll bring them on. Um, but it's not something that is a focal point at the moment. Um, I actually used it to build a tremendous network already. and We did 450 of them. So it's like, oh, well, I should leverage this network and get back to work. Um, kind of the way I see it. But um, I still so probably do a couple of months. at least once a week? No, I would say probably closer to only one or two a month. Um, in general, in general, in life right now, I'm focused on quality over quantity. 
I've done a lot of quantity of a lot of things. Right now, it's like, how can I be more efficient? Well, you make start more with quality. <laughs> you start with quantity to then mm -hmm. develop into quality, and then mm -hmm. you supply, demand, basic economics. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, so we got a good foundation. Most people have yeah. never done 450 podcasts, right? So we have a little bit of experience, um, but now yeah, we're focusing on I wonder how many <laughs> I've done because I've been doing this, my podcast for about two and a half years, something like that, pretty much every week. Maybe there'll be three or four weeks where I don't do a podcast. So let's just say there's 50 a year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 450 is a lot. It's an absurd number. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. How long have you guys been doing the podcast? I think we started in 2021. So we were doing five a week for a while. Okay, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, What I found. That's a lot of podcasts. Wow. It was. Yeah, we were doing them in marathon session. It was actually a lot of fun um, going from one to the next every Friday. Um, it was a lot of fun. Most people don't know this, but like being the host of a podcast actually improved my sales ability. You get better at asking questions and that's all sales you is. Do. It's the ability to communicate. Yeah. I've noticed that I've gotten better because on every episode, people do what you've been doing. Oh, that's a good question. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, Rayon. That's a good question. Now being a coach, you learn to ask a lot of questions too. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Tim, is there anything else that you want to share? You know, you have a, a soapbox, jump up on it. Um, we did the rooftop message. I usually end there with the rooftop <laughs> message. Like if you were to give advice to a captive audience who is really going to hear it and heed it, what would that advice be? And so what else <laughs> do you want to say before we wrap up? Um, I think... Do you have an think, ask, a pitch, a plug? I was about to say, nothing immediately comes to mind. I would just say, if, if you're interested in me and what I'm doing in any capacity, or if you just need help in real estate in general, I would say my niche now is wholesale. Um, that is the one I'm going all in on, because you make more money when you're focused. Um, so focus on one thing and get really good at it. Um, but I could help anybody in real estate. I am passionate about helping people. Um, so if you want to chat or, or discuss um, potentially collaborating together, you could just reach to me out on Facebook Messenger. Um, okay. And I could put a link, a direct link to that if you want. It's like m.me slash timnc23. Are you going to do it in the comments here and then I can transfer it over? Yeah. Okay. I'm always happy to chat. I'm always happy to help people and give advice. Um, it's, it's a real passion of mine. I found making money is never going to make you fulfilled. Um, but helping other people is a great way to do that. Yeah, so. absolutely. I agree. Um, let me put that in there. So if anybody wants to chat with Tim, um, if you'd like to connect with, with Tim, you can reach him here. And Tim, you are a member of the group, right? So you can get in the group and reference the live we did and answer any questions people might have for you. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So Tim, it was a joy having you um, on the on the as a guest today. I really like what you're doing. I like your attitude. Um, you would be a good podcast host. You've got a great voice for radio. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's fun. A lot of people ask me like, oh, how long did it take you? I was like, I this was just, this is just my natural speaking voice. Yeah. Like, there's, yeah. there's nothing. I'm not doing anything clever here. Yeah. I promise. It's a good it's voice. A, <laughs> you so got a good you. voice there, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you. everybody. Go out there. You know, look. You got to get out there and take action. No excuses, just results. You got to practice it to master it. You overcome fear and frustration through doing the reps, through practice, by putting in the hours, by putting in the calls. That's how you learn. That's how you get better. That's how you master a skill, a craft. And that's also the best recipe for overcoming fear and a lack of confidence and insecurity is massive action 
diving in face first, getting muddy, bloodied, and scarred, and learning from experience. So go out there and do that. Take action. No excuses. Go get results. Thanks, Tim. Bye, everybody. Love it.